In our final story of the night, Dottie Lou Norwood takes us back to 1953 and silhouettes on paper shades in Shade Women. walk into my bedroom after a long day at work. I turn on bedside lamps, fold back the comforter and sheets, pump up my feather pillow while eyeing the bedside table for my favorite books. Yet one nightly ritual remains before I cozy into bed waiting for sleep to come. With an air of grace and poise, I walk to my bedroom window looking up into the starry, starry night, recapturing snatches of times when a curious baby girl peeped through curtain windows intrigued with life beyond baby's court. It was 1953. My mom and dad owned and operated one of the first tourist courts built in the small town of DeQueen, Arkansas, with a population of 2,886. Davis Court was situated one block from the courthouse square. Oh, there was no mis missing it. Because when cars turned the corner onto to De Queen Avenue, a seven-foot bellman made of metal, wearing a painted lime green uniform trimmed in black and with white gloves stood almost to the edge of the street. And right before twilight time, the bellman came to life with the flip of a switch causing him to glow brightly with neon lights while waving his arm up and down, beckoning weary travelers to spend the night. As was common in the 50s, TV was not a luxury offered at Davis Court. Oftentimes, people spending the night would congregate in the front yard, sitting in uncomfortable lawn chairs, whiling away the evening, talking of UFOs, wars, are rumors of wars. My parents had already met the guests personally when they came inside the office to register, but it was not a real office. Dad had placed a mahogany desk close to the front door of our personal living room with the pegboard above where huge room keys were hung on tiny gold hooks. I remember the keys were so large they would not fit into the pockets of men's trousers. After allowing the tourists sufficient time to unload their luggage, I would accompany Mom as we pushed the ice cart to the rooms, filling water pitchers while asking if there were anything else our guests needed. Mom would also extend an invitation to join us in the front yard in the cool of the evening. <coughs> On those evenings, the voices and laughter of the tourists blended as stories were shared under shadows cast by the wagon bellman. Mesmerized by people who live beyond our small town, I listened to the banter of their voices until the end of the day took its toll and my head would begin to bobble. I would feel Mom's hand on my shoulder as she would say, Dottie Lou, say your good nights. We'll see you in the morning. Giving Mom and Dad good night kisses and saying good night to our guests, I walked into the house, hearing the front screen door bang behind me as I began my nightly rituals. Walking from the bathroom into my bedroom, I pulled the string on the lamp attached to the headboard of my bed, turned back the covers, and plumped up my feather pillow while eyeing my bedside table checking to be certain my favorite book, The Boxcar Children, was within reach. But there was one more nightly ritual before going to sleep, and it required dark. Snuggling under my white chenille bedspread, I pulled the chain on my lamp and thus began the waiting for the evening performance of the shape of me. From my bedroom window, I could see a grand old house with a white rectangular sign in the front yard emblazoned with black letters, informing those who passed by there are rooms to be rented at the Hallett apartment. Little did the renters know the windows of their apartments facing my bedroom were like movie screens where I could watch 
walking from room to room as lights went off or came on, much like the slides clicking from frame to frame. Some people in the apartments chose to curtain their windows. However, most used plain white paper shades. As shades were pulled down, images would appear through those thin sheets of paper, which only pretended to hide the people within. I became quite adept in approximating what time the windows would light as people began their nightly routines. I could see children playing, a family seated around a table having supper, a man and a woman walking from room to another as the man pointed his finger toward the woman's face. And there was one window where a couple sat as if frozen in front of a huge radio. They never moved. Yet I must confess, the women on the top floor were the most fun for small eyes peeping into other people's lives. Growing up in the 1950s, I never saw pictures in magazines or actors in movies who were not properly clothed. <laughs> My own mom's body was a mystery to me. I had never seen her without clothes except for an occasional accidental opening of the bathroom door as she was dressing. This I did know about my mom. She was a typical mom who had a large bus line from nursing five children, and she was healthy all over. <laughs> this was the image I had of all grown women, clothed or in the bus. <laughs> the women who lived on the top floor of the Howland Apartments taught me differently. <laughs> Where they worked, I didn't know. <laughs> they came home to their apartment after dark, turned on the light, pulled down the two shades facing the Davis Court, which supposedly gave them privacy, and they would get comfortable. Off came buttoned up white cotton blouses and pleated swinging skirts, leaving these slender women clothed in lacy silk slips. Within minutes, off came their high heels. Then they walked away from the window to wherever, doing whatever that my probing eyes could not see. However, I knew the performance would continue. So turning on my bed lamp, I would reach for the boxcar children to read. My eyes would dart from book to window until once again their shadows appeared on the shades. Turning out my light, my inquiring eyes saw the tight French twist in which their hair had been caught, were now loose and flowing as the shade women tugged and pulled and eventually skimmed over their heads their lacy silk slips. There on the shade would be stark silhouettes of women in bras, panties, and garter belts holding up dark, seductive hooks, propping their feet upon chairs while leaning forward. Their hands would slide over the tight-fitting garter belts, releasing the lacy straps holding the delicate hosiery, and then using both hands slither the hosiery down their long legs and off the tips of their toes. Walking to the chest of drawers, sliding out the top drawer where hosiery boxes were opened, carefully they folded the sheer hosiery into layers of white tissue paper. Reaching hands to their backs, off came the pointy bras, and with arms stretched toward the heavens, gauzy gowns were allowed to slip down over their sumptuous bodies. With one last pull on the overhead solitary bulb suspended from a black cord in the middle of the ceiling, the light was off. The evening performance of the shade movie was over. And with my nightly ritual completed, I would cozy deep under the covers, waiting for sleep to come. Fifty years later, <laughs> as scenes from those long past nights capture my memory. Standing in front of my own window, I closed my eyes in a prayerful repose. What did I learn from these women whose names I never knew? Well, I had always known my mom was beautiful. 
but the shade women confirmed what I innately knew, even as a young girl. Only an artist could have created a woman. Through the growing years, my body did become sculpted, though physically, I never fit the criteria of being what the world would call a number 10. No, that never happened. But I will tell you what did happen. On my bedroom windows are white paper shades. <laughs> <laughs> Just waiting to be pulled out when darkness covers the face of the earth. And even though years and wisdom have taught me wherein real beauty lies, the shade women did make a lasting impression on me of the joy of being feminine. Standing at my window, staring out into the dark night, I wonder if any little baby girl has peered across the lawn late into the evening, watching me with curiosity as she questions, are older women beautiful too? If she has, I hope she has seen me sitting in bed reading to my grandchildren. Perhaps she's even laughed with me as I stood kitty off the end of my bed while caressing and loving her. Was she surprised as I twirled around in a pretty gown acting as if I were her age? Does she notice the beautiful artwork I've chosen to hang on my walls or the pictures of friends and family on my bedside tables? Can she see my passion for teaching as I study my lessons each night? And hopefully, she has been watching when the love of my life walks into my room, putting his strong arms around me. Or even now, as I look up into the starry, starry night, is she watching me? Hmm, goodness. I don't think I've ever propped my foot upon a chair wearing a garter belt. <laughs> with dark, seductive poetry. Yet, there's always another night for a shade woman's performance, <laughs> even for a seasoned woman. With eyes closed and my hand on the cord, I whisper into the night, thank you, shade women, who lived on the top floor of the Howlett Apartments in 1953 for making me aware of the magnificence of being a woman. Good night. Yeah. Yeah. Dottie Lou Norwood was born and reared in DeQueen, Arkansas, and lived there until 1990. She moved to West Texas, where she was a superintendent of schools, until returning to Arkansas four years ago. She is currently teaching as a part-time professor for the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. 